in the space we are on the traditional ter territory of the Anishinaabe, including the Ojibwe and the Nation, the Haudenosaunee, also known as the Iroquois, which includes the United Nation, the Lenape, also known as the Delaware, and the Atawada, also known as the Neutral, and the also known as the Huron Peoples. In this space, I acknowledge the privilege I have as being the executive director of the Coalition to, uh, for Gender Equality. And this means that I experience a great amount of power along with a great amount of responsibility. And I participate actively tonight in this acknowledgement of the land to ground me in the rest of the work I do. Today, it is important for me to center the land as a me myself for the concepts I, of my gathering here together. When I feel connected and centered, I feel more open and prepared to listen wholeheartedly. To take, today, I'm thankful for the land for many reasons, but recently, with all that has been happening in this world, and even I am even more aware of how important it is to care for the land in which we live. The past few years have been difficult for all of us, and sometimes it may uh, feel like we're hopeless. The agreement on which the land we stand is the Treaty 6, established in 1796. Reminding myself of this history helps me contextualize what it means to be a Londoner. It gives me a pause to think about the impacts of colonization and the community in which the space long before the city limits were established. This is especially helpful to us as we work to build a new uh, community. And finally, I wanna acknowledge that the work uh, we do at this coalition is about gender justice. And without doing this work, we didn't know that so many of the folks we have would not have the support and work um, to continue. So Mikwich, thank you and welcome. So, <laughs> um, welcome everybody. It is my ex uh, honor to uh, introduce our guests. So we have uh, Rachel Etchener, who is a recent MBA grad currently working at Unilever Canada and Marketing. Prior to Unilever, Rachel was a morning radio personality of Virgin Radio for six years in both Halifax and Nova Scotia and London. She is also the founder of a social enterprise called Here For Her, which focuses on health education. Rachel is a menstrual equity advocate and speaker having Free menstrual products initiatives in school boards, university workplaces, and at both municipal and now federal level. Rachel is a passionate and social passionate about social change politics and loves spending time with her rescue pup named Bam. Welcome, Rachel. Next, we have Rebecca Zandenberg. She has worked for CBC for more than fifteen years. She comes to us from CBC. Kelowna, where she has hosted the popular afternoon show, Radio West. Rebecca helped launch the program back in uh, 2011. Rebecca grew up in rural Ontario and spent many years in Ottawa, graduating from Carleton University, a, journal, a journalism program. She has also spent three years at CBC there, hosting news reading and reporting. Rebecca has worked in CBC stations and all over the country, including a stop just down the highway from London in winter. She also spent their time at CBC bureaus in Halifax, Iloquot, and Whitehorse. She also teaches journal journalism, most recently at Carleton University. She also taught at the National University in Rwanda and Cape Peninsula University of Technology in South Africa. She filmed radio documentary. She filmed radio documentaries from Rwanda and South Africa. Rebecca is an avid runner and keen to lace up and run the endless riverfront trails in London, along with uncovering every second hand and mid-century shop she can. And lastly, we welcome Sarah Halabi. Uh, she has a PhD in education from Western University and is a professor at Fanshawe College. Her research primarily has focused on Muslim girls' experiences with Islamophobia, sexism, and anti-Black racism in Ontario secondary public schools. She has been annually asked lecture on topics of is Islamophobia in schools for the Bachelor of Education program at UWO and has been part of a number of panels aimed to highlight the misconceptions of Islam at Bra. She has also been featured on Rogers TV to discuss misconceptions of the veil. Welcome everyone. 
So the first question, um, and the question we always ask is, what does gender justice mean to you? So <laughs> who wants to go first? You want us to just, do you want to, okay, go in the order you introduced us in? <laughs> sure, we'll start with the first question in that order. Okay, all right, I'll jump in. Um, it's interesting because first of all, when I hear gender justice, you can't talk about gender justice without discussing uh, race. Um, that's a huge part of it. So I would say when I speak about gender justice, you have to have an intersectional feminist lens. Um, but then to me, it should be that every person should be able to have equal opportunities, um, equal pay and be valued and respected regardless of their gender um, in all areas of their life. And I guess from my opinion, talking about this, it's terrifying like to me, how much work needs to be done still from a gender equity perspective, um, race equity. Um, and then, you know, once all that work is done and those resources and opportunities opportunities are together, then we can achieve gender equality. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, I can go next. Um, I mean, obviously I echo everything Rachel just said. I, I, I kind of want to speak about it in terms of what I do, I guess, and how I, um, hope to highlight uh, women and and as she pointed out, uh, Rachel pointed out, you know, the intersectionality of, of women and the importance of highlighting voices that are Indigenous, Black and racialized people. Um, so we, I mean, I try to do that on the radio every day and making sure that we tell stories of women who um, may be running into barriers and, and acknowledging which barriers exist. I mean, that's one of the things we do all the time on the program and we try to do in our reporting and I think we're getting better at it, it's particularly uh, the race piece. I think for a long time we thought if we were talking about women that was good enough, if it was a woman, our job was done. Um, and I think that has been especially, you know, in, a, in the last couple of years, you know, there's been a reckoning in my, in my own head, I think, of, 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 of all of that. And I think that, um, you know, our job is better served at making sure that we bring all voices to the table and, um, and telling the stories of people who have been wronged and exposing sort of injustices, I think is a big part of what gender justice is in the work I do, is exposing when it has gone awry, I think. Muted. <laughs> I just wanted to clap first before I started. So, um, I definitely agree with uh, Rachel and Rebecca and really appreciate the intersectionality piece because I think, and I said this before, uh, gender justice is typically defined in one typical way. And this is this typical way is often rooted in white middle class femininity. And not only does this exclude minority women, uh, oftentimes companies capitalize off of this definition. I think we're, go we're going to be talking about this uh, later on. So when I think of gender justice in a more global kind of way where I think all women can relate to it is um, I feel like gender justice will be achieved when uh, women are no longer objectified, no longer have to uh, place their majority of their self-worth on their looks or how they can um, contribute to the household and whatnot. And while sometimes those things are important, there's too much emphasis on that. And I think gender justice would be achieved when, you know, women are no longer objectified and instead looked at as valued human beings who can contribute in multiple different ways in society. So that's just a very brief um, sort of definition of what I believe gender justice to be. Where we're no longer objectified, we're humans, and so we look at, look at humans, looked at as humans, and I feel like this is something all women can relate to around the world. Yeah, thank you so much. So we'll start. We'll just go right back to you, Sarah, with the next question. And in the past, media has been overtly discriminatory in terms of gender. Where are we today, and have there been improvements, or would you argue that media continues to promote gender stereotypes and gender inequality? Okay, do you want me to go or do you want to go in the order though? Okay, so 
Yeah, so I definitely believe that the media has improved regarding overt uh, forms of gender discrimination. So we have come a long way, um, but I feel like the implicit gender discrimination is definitely there. And I think it relates back to the first question too, specifically focusing on, you know, gender justice. And I'm going to focus on how this is advertised in the media. There's sort of one way um, this is typically advertised. And there's this message that the increased sexualization of women and less clothing is perceived as the only form of empowerment. And a lot of companies use this in a way, you know, instead of, you know, they make it seem as if they're trying their best to uh, be equitable and inclusive for all women, but they're objectifying women under that premise. It's sort of a smoke screen. And um, Ariel Level. Lev uh, Levy talks about this in her book called Ranch Culture. And while this is an old publication, a lot of it still rings true today. And she basically says it's not that, you know, some women do find less clothing and increased sexualization to be empowering, and that's fine. It's just the way the media perpetuates it as the sole definition of gender justice. And um, there's many definitions of how women feel empowered. And so just to focus on this one type of empowerment, empowerment um, is, is, I feel, an implicit way that the media still perpetuates um, gender discrimination. And I still uh, believe what rings true today is that sex sells. Um, and so we can definitely see that uh, reoccurring in advertisements, uh, on social media, on shows. And I was just talking to Rachel about this uh, before we started, but like um, if we look at social media, for example, and what videos tend to become viral, um, you know, there's this saying that, you know, or this thought that social media sort of democratizes fame where like anyone has a chance to become famous. But if we were to see the viral videos and there's research done on this um, and we see that the typical viral videos are those who emulate those social norms. And a part of that is we see the viral videos of women with the ideal body shape, with the ideal beauty standards. And this is constantly being recycled and young girls are watching this. And it's no surprise that the BBL, if you don't know what that is, the Brazilian butt lift is one of the most common uh, plastic surgeries uh, girls uh, do. And it's actually one of the most dangerous types of surgery. It has the in, a most increased risk. And we see that, you know, the beauty, the multi-billion dollar beauty industry definitely uh, profits off of this beauty ideal, this beauty standard that we keep perpetuating ourselves, right? And, and so um, I believe that um, the implicit aspect still exists. And even um, in cartoons, right? I was looking at some of the cartoons my niece watches and I, I'm like, what is going on here? Like, what is this girl going to learn from seeing these things? And then there's some recent research done by Montas and colleagues that found that cartoons um, for girls between ages six to 11, I believe it was, they found a significant proportion of sexualized images of uh, girls in cartoons. And so what does this uh, say? Like what message is this sending to us from when we're young? How are we socialized? So, um, and when I talk about the media here, I'm talking about media in terms of mass media. What Rebecca is doing is, I believe, countering that. She's fighting against that with what she does. So I want to be very clear when I'm talking about media. I'm not talking about all media. I'm just talking about the mass media and the general trends of media. And it's great to have someone like Rebecca, you know, who captures the various voices of various women from diverse backgrounds. And so, like, uh, when we go to the last question, I think that's one way. We won't get there now, but I think what Rachel is doing is one. Oh, Rebecca, sorry. Rebecca, what she's doing definitely speaks to that. So I hope that answered the question. It did. Thank you. That was so enlightening and, you know, so true. So much to, to think about. Rebecca, same question. Yeah. So um, I guess I'll, I'll probably talk mostly about the, the media in people who do journalism more than, than because I think um, we certainly heard a lot of, from you. So thank you on, on the media more generally and, in, 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 you know, in commercialization of all kinds of 
things. Um, but just the other day, I did a story about a woman who was in a parking lot and she was, she, and she, you know, she calls herself fat. And because fat is just another name for another word that is a description, like skinny, like tall, like short. So she's, she's a fat woman. Um, and she is white and she was in the parking lot and she was trying to get out of her car. And it was, um, she was parked to next to a gentleman in a car. And as she was getting out, the man said to her, um, oh, I didn't know if you're going to make it out of there, like sort of taunting her a little bit. Um, so she had shared this story on social media and I decided I wanted to tell her story. Like, what is it like being a woman in a larger body? And what does that mean for the kinds of jeers that you still get in 2022 from people? Um, and so she told her story. And as I was doing this story, and this is an example of how I think the media is doing better. And someone like myself, who is a white woman, is trying to do better. But, you know, Five years ago, I did this. I, I would have done this story. I wouldn't have thought twice about asking her, "What if you were not white? How do you think it would have even uh, been harder for you?" And I, and we did talk about that. And then I went to um, uh, an organization based in Toronto that deals with um, larger women who are also, uh, you know, it was run by two founders who are, I think, black. So it's like, so I went to them and talked to them about their experiences. And I think the media is doing better. And I'm an example of this you know, where I, 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 I went the extra mile and I said, okay, you know what, like this, this is, again, it's the intersectionality. It's of, of it's not just a simple story about um, someone who's existing in a, in a body that is not the conventional beauty standard. And it's even more difficult for those who are not white. So I was, you know, I think that, and, and I think we do those sorts of things every day now where we're trying to sort of capture the story in a more comprehensive way. Um, you know, we always do stories uh I do or we used to where we think that the listener you know I host a radio program where you think that the listener is like you right and so you know you're like let's talk about Ramadan and we're like here's what it is everybody do you know what Ramadan is and then we like enlighten our listeners well probably a lot of people listening are actually they know very well what it is and they might be you know celebrating and 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 doing all of the things that i'm trying to tell them about or, or you know we're trying to enlighten our listeners about so it's finding this balance of um gender equality in in also providing information but also recognizing that you know we're, we don't all look the same and i think that gen gender justice and the media doing better is making sure that we understand who is in our community and and speaking um to them and 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 having them tell us about themselves and um, letting them share their own stories, I think, is a big part of making sure that we are better capturing um, the stories that are out there. And I think that that's a big piece of what we are trying to do now. Um, I know, and, and I even to, just today, I got an email from someone who said. I have, a, I have like, she's an advocate who works on behalf of women and girls who have been sexually assaulted. And she said, I have someone who wants to share her story. And her story was that she was sexually assaulted by an intimate partner. Um, and when the police came to her door, and I believe the police officer was a woman, they felt as though their, their concerns weren't being met with any sort of um, sincerity. And they felt like they were being dismissed. And in the end, it was a, it was a, you know, there was no resolution. And so she wants to share her story. And I think that, you know, part of the Me Too movement was really starting from a point where you believe women. Um, and I think that that's, that's the Me Too movement, I think, sort of shifted the needle on that. I mean, you know, as journalists, it's, it's difficult because I, you know, will post something on Twitter, a story and everyone, or you'll see something a sort of trend on social media and everyone's believe her, believe her. So yes, we do that. And that's the place from which we start. But then we, we also as journalists have to like, make sure that the story stands and we, you know, we have to, we have, our, we have our journalism to do as part of that work. Um, but the starting point I think is, is different than where we were maybe five years ago, which I think is really important. Um, and that's also part of gender justice, believing women and, and believing, um, uh, you know, what they tell you. And then, and then another part, I think of, of course, as, and I'm a mom of three young kids, uh, they're five. And so my daughter's almost six. So it was interesting when you talked about the cartoons, because <laughs> she, she used to, she stopped doing it now, but she used, was watching the Barbie show for a while. 
And I was like, oh, Joan, her name's Joan. Joan, do you really want to black? And then I'd be like, okay, but where are the, where are the, where are the people who aren't white? And luckily, at least, at least <laughs> they may be tall and thin, but they have some characters on the show who, who are not only white. But I'm always, you know, I'm very, very cognizant of the images that are feeding into her brain. So now she's watching Wild Kratz, which is better. Um, but being a mom of three, and then I have twin boys who are four. Um, so, and I think that's part of, knowing a woman's work and a woman's worth whether or not like i stay at home moms let me tell you they are you know anytime we can depict a stay at home mom in a way that sort of captures the i think almost war the hard work that they do like any time like i just think that that is part of and and you know we we try to tell those stories and we have for years but i i just don't think people understand fully of 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 uh realizing fully realizing what it is women moms do at home a day to day so i think that's a big part of um making sure the media is is capturing it and we you know now that daycare and ten dollar to day daycare is really coming into focus i think there is understanding of the of the worth of taking care of children so i think that's another big piece of of the media's accountability and in, in, in better serving our listeners with with a clearer picture of, of women yeah Thank you so much, Rebecca. Rachel? Oh my gosh, there's so many things to <laughs> pick up on and jump in on from both Sarah and Rebecca. Um, and I, oh, I like my head's exploding because of course I made some notes about things I wanted to chat about, but there's just so many things. So I think from my perspective, um, so I was in radio for six years, but not a journalist like Rebecca. So I was on a different type of format of radio. Um, and so in this way, my experience, I'll come from like as a, morning radio, CHR we call, so like top 40 music, hit music. It's honestly more of like a lifestyle show. Um, so I'll come from that perspective. And then also currently being a marketer, um, I would say kind of I'm feeling both of what Sarah and Rebecca said in the sense that we've definitely made progress from a gender equity um, perspective. I know when I started in radio, I created their Instagram account. So like that was when <laughs> everything was starting to kind of change in terms of social media. Um, but I would say personally, I feel like it hasn't um, improved, of course, the way it, it should be. Um, and I have mixed feelings about like being a marketer and being on social media basically all day. And then kind of to say what Sarah was saying, obviously we're marketing um, really big brands where I work and I honestly struggle with that because I think it's, first of all, gender stereotypes continue to be reinforced. And I think it's twofold. So from a social media perspective, I have mixed feelings because there's been so much awareness, so much education, great accounts like Beauty Redefined, for example, who are two PhDs and they chat about all of this. Um, so go check out that account if you haven't yet. It's amazing. Um, and so there's so much great um, advocacy out there. But then on the flip side, I do believe it's actually, you know, gotten worse from a perspective of objectifying women. Um, and I, we can chat more more about our experiences in the next question, but I know I have personally had that working in radio and television for six years. Um, so I think reducing women to their appearance is still something so prevalent um, in media from again, a traditional media to a new platforms perspective. And for example, like a TikTok, there's so many great things about TikTok where there's young diverse voices finally being heard. Um, and we can amplify that like so much great work and social justice causes. But at the same time, the algorithm is very much, you know, based on the appearance of women. Um, and I know on Instagram, their algorithm favors those types of images. So um, being someone that runs a social enterprise, we can see where our algorithm and our posts are actually getting dismissed because we don't fit into that certain, um, you know, image that kind of Sarah was speaking about that gets promoted on social media. And that's so real today. So I think from a social media perspective, it's, it's kind of that fine line of monitoring what you're consuming, of course. But then I think from a media perspective, and we can get into like how I feel media should be better. And again, I'm speaking mass media, but then also radio and television vision and folks in that industry I think they and Rebecca I wish there were like all Rebecca's in the journalism because there's a lot of folks that don't do what Rebecca are doing and there's still a lot of cis males that you know are in the media industry that don't take the consideration and you know they're not they're not having this lens diverse uh lens on when they're you know picking up stories some are but some still aren't 
Um, and so I think it, there's a lot to be, a lot of work to be done again from my perspective in media for folks that are in the industry as well to be better. Um, and I could go on and on, but I think that's kind of, currently I think we've made improvements 100%, but I feel it's also bombarding, um, especially youth with again, the sexuality of women and women just not re being respected for their bodies and uh, as human beings, but instead being objectified um, on their appearance. And I think there's a lot of work to be done and it's honestly kind of terrifying to be honest, I feel as, as a marketer who's always on um, social and consuming nonstop. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. It's, there's just so much to think about. And I um, represent sort of janitorial staff and it's often uh, sort of uh, women that, you know, this isn't their country of origin or they they all have sort of reasons why they're, they're working in janitorial. And um, uh, we just did a, a sexual harassment case and on <laughs> March 8th, the employer says to me, I don't think we have enough. And I can tell you, there is enough. It's gonna make me cry. There's enough. All of the things are there. And the employer stop is just saying, well, you know what? Well, she didn't refute it. She didn't not come to work. She didn't do all these things where well, she has no empowerment to do it. And it's so gross to me. That's the word in my head all the time. It's so gross to me because if she worked in corporate Canada, if she worked in these other things, she could say me too. But, you know, there's this just sort of this underlying foundation of this janitorial staff where, you know, you're not going to get better work because you're here for a reason and that she should just shut up and do her work. And it's just so gross. So we're not going to shut up and she's not going to do her work and she's going to keep fighting. But, you know, we, we talk about how far we come. And then you see this young girl, she's 24. She's got all of these things stacked against her. And then this employer, that's basically that telling her just shut up and clean the toilets um it, it makes me think we really haven't come as far as we're you know we want to have come because it's layered that like all of these pieces are layered and you know i feel so privileged that i have such a voice and i can yell and scream and, and i can fight and she just doesn't see that voice and, and you know for somebody to keep saying you you don't have to do this this is not the way it should be for you but she, nobody has told her that up to this point so you know all of the work you do is so important because you are telling these young women, you know, me too, and they got to keep fighting. So what has your, been your personal experience with gender inequality in the media? And Rebecca, we'll start with you. You're on mute, Rebecca. Sorry, I was just going to write you a nice comment. So then I missed the question again. Can you just remind me what it is? <laughs> Yes, the question is, what has your personal experience with gender inequality in the media been? Mm. Well, I'm going to start with like a very personal, it's not even like a big deal, but it was at the time and it made me really mad. <laughs> so uh, when I was, so I started like working as a journalist right out of university. So I think I was working at CB CBC Edmonton and I was probably 22 or 23 or something. And like I was looking around the newsroom and there were a lot of like crusty old white guys working there, which is fine, whatever. They were good reporters. They all wore jeans. So I was wearing jeans. And by the way, like when you're a reporter, you're often like sent out in the field. You don't know what you're going to be doing. So I wore jeans every day. And so did the dudes, a lot of them. Anyway, and then one day a woman took me aside, like one of the assignment editors or something. And she said, I don't think you should be wearing jeans to work. And I was livid. <laughs> So I just thought like no one said anything to any of these other guys like why anyway it was just such a double standard like you know you are supposed to look the part in a different way than the man is the man can be a grizzled old guy in his jeans and his like sweat stained shirt and that's fine but you have to look pretty so I, I was anyway that that so that's that's like a really it's at the time it really it still makes me mad apparently <laughs> um but you know I I think that um I'm just trying to think of like in a, in a sort of broader context of how you see these things play out uh, affecting me personally. I like, I, I don't, I, I, again, I feel very privileged where I am. I've, I've been able to sort of work my way up at CBC to become a host. I don't, I, I don't think I, as a woman, I don't feel as though that's been a hindrance in getting to where I am today. I don't know if that's would be true for me if I, um, 
were not white. There is a CBC has a really strong push right now to try to get more diverse voices, more diverse uh, people on the air. And I think that we're doing, um, I think we're doing a better job. You know, I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, sort of token faces. They're not token because they're great journalists, but there is the, the forward facing people a lot of the time are the people that uh, they hire to, so that, you know, we sort of can, can, can look like we're doing a good job. But I think behind the scenes, there are still a lot of people in upper management who are not diverse. We're getting better. We are getting better and it takes time. Um, but that's, I think that's a, a, a way that I've seen uh, the gender piece, the, particularly the diverse gender piece, um, working its way into, into this conversation. Um, yeah, come back to me. I need some more thoughts. <laughs> But that's, yeah, that's where I'd start. But I, yeah, so I, like, it's just, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done. And I think there's a lot of times where women are still not entirely believed, or there's a lot of um, wanting to know someone's background before you believe them, that kind of thing, I think, still goes yeah. on. Um, so, it's yeah. funny we don't know how many times we're, like, shutting up and smiling. Right, like, because we think we should just shut up and smile until yeah. somebody else does it. You're like, shit, that's me too. Like, I do that too. I don't mean me too. I mean, yeah, sometimes I shut up and smile too just to get along and what that all, what all that means. Yeah. Next quota, um, Rachel, what has been your personal experience with gender inequality? Yeah, so I made some notes on this because I want to be obviously succinct on this, but there were a few things. So I can kind of jump into what um, actually a story is similar to what Rebecca just shared and it just sticks out in my mind. Um, we, and again, I'm a different type of radio in a different company, um, but this is my experience. So we had billboards and these were in London, actually. Um, I can't remember now, like maybe four years ago. Um, They're all across the city of London and in the billboard was myself in the middle um, with my two cis male coworkers on either side of me the idea is we you know we get up at four in the morning I was on the morning show so my hair was always up in a bun every day I never wore makeup plus I just don't anyway um <laughs> and I would be wearing a full sweatsuit so in our billboard that's what we portrayed I literally was barely wearing any makeup in the photo um and my hair was up in a bun and that is real life and that is who I am um and we wanted to be really authentic about our show and our branding um and the amount of comments I received I can't even, like, I can't even count them. There's probably like hundreds um, constantly about why I had my hair up and how my hair would look better down and that I was um, a rose between two thorns and I needed to show that off more. Um, and so just making the point that like when I, again, working in that industry for six years, I was only ever objectified based on my appearance, my male coworkers. I never, in our own text platform, people could just text us while they were listening, like all the time. We never received a, a comment about my coworkers in terms of their appearance. Every comment I ever received was about my appearance. And it was amplified when I made a strong statement. It could have been an opinion about something political. It could have been an opinion about, I like croissants and I would just get like attacked on my appearance. And so from my perspective, I mean, 100%, it was like my male coworkers were held to a different standard than I was, number one. And number two, it was just based on my appearance, which also kind of, you know, amplifies again on social media, what is, you know, what trends is typically on Instagram anyway, you know, appearance-based um, content. And I know somebody commented in the chat just saying, you know, some women partake in that, but we have to remember how children are being socialized when they're young, right? So when they're like, you know, less than two watching shows that, again, you're pretty, oh, you're so quiet, you're so beautiful, you're so pretty, you're, like, those are the comments that young girls receive compared to young boys, so, like, you have to put all of that into perspective, too, um, and again, anyways, but that's just kind of a rant, but to add to that, um, I would say the pay gap was something that I personally did not experience, I have to say, um, but I did talk about with many of my um, women, co-workers in radio where in my format it was typically the male was the host which I was able to achieve a um, co-host situation when I worked in radio which was amazing where we both had equal um, you know we are a partnership but majority of shows in my format are like the male is the host 
and the woman is the sidekick who kind of laughs at all the jokes and unfortunately that's it's true but unfortunately that's still like real across Canada and many different shows like some companies have made a better effort to change that um and the the hilarious part is that the demographics actually women for the most of these shows um so they've learned I think they've had to adjust because they've realized that wasn't working um but so I think from my perspective there was still a lot like when I left a lot of work that needed to be done um from those two perspectives and then I had one more point I wanted to bring up and oh just about like I think in terms of we need more diverse hosts in media like number one we need more experiences we need more opinions we need more um diversity in general and I think there's still a lot of male hosts when you look at and I'll just speak to like radio and television that um again some are amazing allies and are doing great work but um some aren't and so I think that'll come up in our next question about like how it needs to be better. I think, you know, media hosts need training. Um, first of all, equity training. Um, but I think more cis male hosts and media like need to be better allies. Um, and I just, in my experience, I wasn't seeing that to be honest. And I think that's, you know, traditional media is so influential. Like Rebecca was saying, like all the good work that she does in the story, she chooses like, that's what we need to be doing. But on my format, we're just as influential, you could argue, but not you know maybe doing the work that i felt needed to be done or talking about the things that needed to be talked about um so i think there's a lot of work there that needs to happen thank you rachel so what we need is more rebecca <laughs> a little more rebecca in her life uh, it's interesting last year at the un um i was part of a i was watching a panel and it was the mayor of dublin and she was saying basically the same thing everybody talks about my clothing and not about the politics, my politics, but here she is, the mayor of Dublin, Ireland, and everybody wants to talk about her politics. And on that same panel, there was a, the chief of police from a, a community in Africa, and they said, they all want to talk about my driving, not about my politics and my policy. And it's like, it's incredible when we look at the whole world, we're all still only talking about the same thing when it comes to women. Sarah? Uh, What's been your personal experience with gender, gender inequality in the media? In the media, yeah. So thank you so much, Rachel and Rebecca. I really learned from what you said and, you know, it was really inspiring what you had to say as well. In regards to my own experiences with the media, I will share like a little story and then focus on what I wanted to say before. But as we were talking, I remember uh, something that happened to me. I was addicted to social media. Like I would always go on it and I realized that it was doing no good to me. So I deleted all my TikTok, um, Instagram. I don't go on it anymore. I just stayed away from it. And then one day a friend sent me a video from TikTok and I opened it and then this interesting other video came up and I'm all like, oh, I have to download the app to see this video and I really want to see it because this little clip seems so interesting. So I downloaded TikTok and then literally because I'm new to TikTok, so it just shows you like the random popular videos, like perhaps, I don't know, maybe they know I'm a woman. I'm not sure what the issue was at that point, but literally video after video was of like, women in gym clothes you know with the perfect body and just like video after video after video and so my experience with that is what are these young girls being exposed because that's not the reality of how women look like but when we go on social media we think all women are like that and then we are the outcasts and then how does that define you know our self-worth if especially being young, um, being a teenager where we're just trying to make sense of ourselves, right? And so when we keep being repeated to those images, what does that say to our ourselves? Like, are we not, are we worthless because of that? You know, some girls actually do feel that way. And so that was my experience with uh, reactivating TikTok. But what I wanted to focus about uh, in this particular issue, and taking a little different spin on it and relating it also to my research, is how Muslim women in particular are depicted in the media. And it's really frustrating to see in general, I'm, again, I'm speaking in general terms, there are exceptions, but in general terms, it makes me cringe sometimes how Muslim women are depicted in shows and movies. And specifically, you know, there has been these trends that have been seen that 
typically um, the young Muslim girls oppressed, oppressed by her family. She wears the veil, the veil symbolic of that oppression. And the storyline goes like this. And then she, you know, meets someone, she takes off the veil, she runs away from home. Now she's free. And this sort of recycles these colonial tropes that were used to essentially colonize Muslim lands and essentialize all Muslim women. And so these types of gender stereotypes, you know, do a lot of harm in recycling these generalized stereotypes of Muslim women um, that, you know, Muslim women also internalize themselves. Like uh, somebody had mentioned, I believe it was just in the chat here, someone had mentioned something about, you know, internalizing stereotypes and then also acting on them. And then also, Rebecca, as you were saying that, it was like, you know, remembering, you know, this article I was reading and how sometimes uh, minoritized individuals, including women, internalize it so much that they enforce rules on other women or other minoritized people. So it's really interesting how internalized oppression works. Um, another thing I wanted to mention too, in uh, when some media, some cartoons, for example, I fo I'll focus on cartoons, want to uh, show that, you know, they are doing something for diversity and that they're representing diversity, they try to do like an all-in-one diversity, right? So like, I know uh, Moana, for example, like my niece loves her, but they make her have like a certain shape that's different than the white characters. White women come in all different size and shapes. They don't come in a size four waist and big bust and big hips, right? Or whatever perfect proportion. But for some reason, it's the racialized cartoon characters at times that have the different types of body shapes. And it's like this diversity all in one. And then you also see that within some companies, which is really annoying and cringeworthy, where you have like, oh, we want to show that we're diverse. So... Um, this is what we're doing, but really it's just that representation piece. I think, I don't know if it was Rachel or Rebecca that was saying that, but it really like, caught my attention that, you know, we just want to check off a box, but in turn, it was Rebecca, I believe. Yeah. And so we want to just check off the box and show that we are being diverse and equitable, but really um, we're just showing that representation of it on the outside, but on the inside, where are the senior leaders and whatnot? So that's my um, experience with gender inequality in the media, um, specifically focusing on uh, Muslim women um, in the media and also just my experiences with TikTok and whatnot. But yeah, and um, just looking back to like when I was younger, and I think that's why I keep repeating this objectification part um, and also beauty ideals and standards, because I know that really affected me while growing up. And while I have some done work, I done work on myself, not like uh, plastic surgery, but like actually inner work. Um, it still like gets to me sometimes as well, if I'm going to be vulnerable here. Um, but then I'm remind, like I remind myself of, you know, that this is how the mass media works. This is how the beauty industry is fueled. And so I feel like it's a topic that really resonates with me because like as a teenager, I was really affected by that. And I know I'm not the only one and it affects all girls. And I really don't want, I look at my nieces too, and I say, I never want them to place all their self-worth on their looks. They're so intelligent. They're so witty. They're funny. And I just love that about them. Like, and but then you see with um, one of my nieces, she's seven, she's turning seven, and it just breaks my heart that I can see the socialization getting to her when she says stuff like, "Oh, I'm getting fat. I can't eat this. I can't eat that," or something like that. It just like breaks my heart when she says those things, and I just don't want her to put so much emphasis on her physical appearance. So as a family, we've been trying to just center healthy practices in terms of, you know what, it's good to eat healthy for us to feel good. It's good to exercise because this makes us feel good, not because it will change our appearance, but we're focusing more on the mental health, um, happiness, stuff like that. Like, because that's what those are good for. Healthy eating is good for our overall well-being. And but we always focus with what we eat and exercise, oh, I want to look a certain shape. So this is why I'm only going to eat this. But no, it's just a holistic thing that helps us 
feel good and just to focus on that physical ops aspect is just a really sad um thing i think yeah so i think um that's what i have to say about that for now Thank you. Can, I, I'll just, can i just jump in for one second of course on so just on the you talking about your nieces and i as i mentioned my i have a daughter who's almost six and um like i'm really because you know if i'm going to be vulnerable you know i'm also a woman and i you know you you internalize certain things and i have my whole life and so and i'm but i'm very like cognizant of that so when i'm speaking to my daughter i'm always i'm not perfect but i'm you know i'm trying to not say those things like oh your hair looks so pretty like that or use the word pretty like i try really hard not to use that word instead i say oh you're super strong or like you're fast or i try to use words that are like usually reserved for for boys um but it's tough when you have your own inner like i'm not a perfect person so i've got my inner dialogue going on in my myself right so you're trying to push against that and then and and then you're also trying to push against barbie on tv right so it, it's a lot to juggle and and when you have kids i think it's um it becomes that much more important to sort of you're just trying to manage the messages you're trying to like give her a good foundation before she's off into like grade school and she's got a fault or like you know high school and she's got her phone and she's she's talking to her friends and they're feeding her brain with with whatever so you're trying to it's but it feels like a losing battle sometimes for sure yeah it feels like a losing battle but i think what you're doing is great and my sister-in-law does that too because at this age they're like sponges so like if you can put in that information so we also like we work like as a little tribe within our family so we all try to be on the same page so we do the same thing we don't focus on looks when co giving compliments we say oh my god you're so intelligent mm -hmm. oh look at that you you did it because they like she likes to show off her dance moves we say you're just a great dancer or like we just focus on you know or you play great soccer you're really good at karate like stuff like that instead of focusing on you know the looks piece we just even, on it, yeah yeah i was just gonna say even so she, my daughter's she said oh i really i really like ninja stuff like i want to be a ninja but then bennett at school told me girls can't be ninjas and i was like hot damn well who, why did he tell you that <laughs> wow. so, yeah it's like you know and she's she's an sk so it's like oh. i don't know it's just like where where did that come from so you know we, we my husband and i are like yo you can't that's not cool yes you can be a ninja <laughs> See, that's perfect and then so yeah. she was able to say what happened and then you guys had dialogue about it and that's yeah, great sure. and mm -hmm. another thing too as you're talking i was reminded of it's not only how um girls and women are depicted um it's also how relationships are depicted in disney and whatnot how that we're socialized about that from a young age and how we expect men to come and save us we're princesses who need to be come and saved and then that gives us like a very flawed perception of relationships further objectifying us as well and it takes away from the real work a relationship needs to survive in a way so yeah like as you were talking i was reminded it's not just the physical appearance and how we're depicted but also when it comes to our relationships um how we're supposed to be in a relationship and so i feel like that also sets us up for failure in a way yeah Thank you so much. So there's so much that's in my mind as you guys are talking. First of all, um, you know, you you were talking about how, you know, in the end of the story, the, the Muslim women are like free when they remove the veil. And maybe this is inappropriate because I haven't thought it through in my head, but all I can think of is free like the West rest of the Western women to be sexual, sexualized in a different way. Like what, what is that freedom when you know, I have a 26 year old girl who's being sexually harassed at work and there is no freedom either way. And so it, I'm going to think on that a long time, Sarah. It's like stuck in my head and there's there's a piece there that I really need to to, to work out. Um, so the last question is, how can we move forward in a way that is more gender equitable? And Rachel will go to you. Okay, awesome. This is my favorite question because I get <laughs> so passionate about this. I guess from like the radio TV perspective, again, like from the industry I left, I would say many things easy, like better recruitment of diverse talent into media being number one. Um, and then I found, I read this really interesting article and I thought it was so true about, you know, we need more 
mentors, of course, in, you know, any industry. And I agree with that hundred percent mentors are key, but then it's not just a mentor. It's somebody like we need diverse folks in leadership positions in media as well. And I know that was something when I left the industry in the company I was working for wasn't, was non-existent. Um, and so I think like that addition on is like, yes, mentors are great, but we also need women in these positions where things can actually happen and things can change. Um, uh, what else? There's so many things. I think we need to continue to amplify like women's voices in media. Um, I think that's really important. We need to like promote women, pay women, um, put women at the forefront. Um, and I think from a marketing standpoint, um, I think that's a really tough one, like the mass media perspective and kind of just to really quickly add on to what um, Sarah was talking about now what we're seeing. So there has been improvement, of course, sure. Like a lot of companies are using diverse um, folks and then and different body sizes and that's all amazing, but a lot of it is still performative too. It's not, and like, that's the part that as a marketer is driving me insane where um, they're doing diversity all at once. Like what Sarah said, and that's so true what she said about that. Or they're just kind of, you know, throwing somebody in a, in a commercial. But then when you actually look at, you know, the leadership positions, the boards, the, who they hire, like those practices aren't being um, maintained. So I think it's a very layered issue, obviously, but I think, um, you know, we just need to get obviously more women, in, you know, in these positions where things can change. Um, and I think media training from an equity perspective is key. And that was something I was trying to fight for um, when I was in media was like radio hosts, for example, again, in my format, like needed equity training um, because they are so influential just in the language they use, um, you know, making sure that they're inclusive and how they speak about women and just even a lot of cis males having that equity training about, you know, their own reflections on their privilege and how, like, are they willing to give up that privilege to, you know, let women um, be promoted, et cetera, and let their voices be heard. And I think that was the piece for me that um, from my friends still in the industry hasn't happened. There have been some changes, but I think that's just um, brutal to me that somebody has so much influence um, and yet they're not maybe saying the right things and nobody's perfect, but I think that's so key. Um, um, and so that would be something I would, I think the media industry needs to implement. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, Rebecca? Uh, I think we sort of need to go in the same trajectory we're going. Like, I feel like we have made great strides. Like it's, we're, we're out of the leave it to beaver days at least on the face of it. I know it goes deeper than that, but I mean, you know, when you look at the programming that you can you can tune into now in a, in a theater or on television, there are like Orange is the New Black was a, a, you know, a crazy diverse show with like different experiences. And, you know, I'm sure there were problems with that show. I haven't really done a deep dive on it, but at least at the face of it, you know, and I think you have to start somewhere and if it's not perfect I think if, if you're if we're trying and we're 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 starting somewhere which is you know we're sort of at the infancy I think of, in many ways of, of this fight um, but I think we need to to move in the direction we're moving um, and and allowing women to tell and share their own stories um, is really important in the work that I do uh, j just an example um, this week we did on International Women's Day we did a story about uh, women in trades and why they're, I think it's like four, you know, we have this huge gap of the number of workers who we need for trade uh, jobs right now. And, and we have only like 4% of women doing trades jobs. And it's, you know, there's so many reasons why that is. Um, and we can talk about that. But 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 then we, the person we had on the line was a woman and she was a, an advocate for women. And I, and I asked her at one point in the interview and I was like, do, do you do a trade? And she was like, oh no, I don't, I don't do a trade. <laughs> and I just felt like, why aren't we talking to the woman who's, who's like the trades person? I, and we do that a fair bit, but I just think it, it's, it's, it's even better when we can have the, the most authentic voice in every story. And I think um, we, we kind of missed the boat with that interview. She was a great advocate and she, you know, she's really proud of the work that she's doing and she should be, but um, I think the more we can get women to tell their own stories, like if we have the woman on the air who is a plumber and talks about what it's like to go back to the, the, the company office or whatever and deal with what she deals with and what she had to overcome to get to where she is, that would have been more powerful than someone speaking on behalf of that experience. Um, so I, that to me is the number one thing. As for like the, 
the conventional media and the stereotypes and the images that we are bombarded with and my daughter will uh, is about to be bombarded with i don't know <laughs> i feel like that just feels like just the just the giant like moving train that is is headed in the same direction and it's it's really hard to get it off that that path i mean again we're we're moving in some ways in the direction to sort of like divert it from time to time but it's still it's still going in that same path um I don't know. I, 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 but I think that you know the work that is being done, and 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 the work that you know getting women to to who don't know they have a voice, and and helping them have a voice. That's that's key. And so the work that this organization does is is like really instrumental in 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 shaping some of that change. But it is, it is sort of it feels at times insurmountable, changing the course of of the path that we're on. But. I think I think these small nuggets that we're talking about are 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 pushing the train a little bit to slow down at least maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting. So I'm a welder by trade. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so when I went to welding school, there was no toilet seat on the bath toilet. I tell this story quite often. So I would have to go to the bar next door to go to the bathroom and then come back. But now that I'm older, I think about the privilege I held. I could held up a whole half classroom of men there was 18 of them and one of me and I would say oh I'm gonna go to the bathroom I'd go to the bathroom come back and I would make them repeat everything they said but that is a privilege as a, of a white woman of a certain standing in a community that could I could say screw you you all are going to repeat what you say so that I could have the privilege of hearing that um teaching again Mm -hmm. But that is not what will happen for every woman in this community. And so I talk about how I was like put out, I was so angry about it for so many years. But now doing what I do and, and trying to encourage women to the trades, not everybody has that voice. There was power in the fact that I could, you know, as a young something white girl, um, you know, with a certain body type and, and the boobs to make them listen, could shut down the class long enough to go to the bathroom and come back. And they would all repeat what they said. And they might have grumbled about it, but that, that is a sort of a huge privilege. As unfair as it was not to be able to go pee in my classroom and, and move on, the way I looked and who I am allowed me to shut that class down and still learn and then graduate at the head of my class. That is not the experience of, of most women. And it, it is a huge amount of privilege. And so that is the new story we have to talk about. If we want women to be in STEM and trades and, and to see themselves in media, we have to understand that most, not every woman have the privilege that I have and, and, and that some of us have. And that is not would be the experience that they had. They would go to the bathroom and the class would just take off and they would never be able to catch up. And so, you know, it, there's a different story. And, and I think all of the work that you are doing means that there's another woman who gets to get where they're going because they see themselves in you and they hear the messages in you and they're given that piece of hope. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, how can we move forward in a way that's more gender equitable? No, I think uh, what you said was great. And my brother is in the trades. He's a welder as well. And he tells us stories too about, you know, the one woman who's working with them from time to time. And it's just a hard culture to work in in a male dominated uh, industry and yeah he was just sharing she was he was realizing her struggles and sharing it uh, with us so yeah it's uh, definitely i feel like uh, culture of these uh, trades um, industry i feel like that uh, plays a large role as to women might avoid entering the trades but trades is an industry that's much needed in canada especially in the um, financial awards of being in the trades is also very good. Um, so, and women can do uh, the trades. So I don't know why there isn't. Um, I think there is a, like a push. There's an encouragement of women to do the trades, but if we look at, you know, the larger society and what careers women, what uh, are the traditional careers from women and what uh, families typically push the women, we we'll see why they go the other direction as well. Um, as we were talking sort of and I sort of think that we sort of touched on it a little and Rebecca mentioned this as well in terms of how she is with her daughter and and uh, Rachel mentioned mentorship. So I'm going to bring those two together and that uh, looking at it as what we can do as individuals. I think if we um, counter these uh, hegemonic 
messages that we receive if we counter them and redefine them, redefine what it is to be a girl and a woman, and then uh, embody that and how we are as individuals and do a lot of self work um, to not allow those stereotypes to influence how we behave and um, what we do and what we say. And by working on ourselves and being better in that sense, we become a mentor for other women as well because they, they say, oh, they see she's doing great. Like, look how she is. Um, she's not like falling in for or trying to fit in so hard and look how she she's happy. Right. So like thinking of it, th thinking of it in those terms of how we can be mentors for other women by healing ourselves first. Right. We have to heal ourselves first before we can make any change. And and then that works towards the collective work and how we can um, target this. And yeah, it's a big question and there isn't an easy solution. It's very hard and messy, it's just human complexity. Uh, it's messy and there isn't one box, right? But I think starting with ourselves and being good examples ourselves and having integrity ourselves. And even though another woman would see that, you know, maybe she doesn't have the same values as me, but look, look at her integrity. Look at how she's not trying to fit in and whatnot. Like that, can, I see that myself with other women and they inspire me. They just change. I'm having like not the greatest day and I see that in another woman and it just changes my perspective. It makes me feel more positive and I look up to her. So I think that's one way we could address this. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, moderating for you uh, sort of fierce, amazing women. Um, I find, I find it like I'm listening. I'm like, oh, wait, I should I should be ready to speak, but I'm not because I'm like everything you have said has been so sort of thought-provoking and it's like got me thinking about things that I cannot uh, verbalize yet 